Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Season's Greetings. Um, this is the first program where I do ask everybody to silence their cell phones now. Uh, those of you who are new to us, if you'd like to get uh, emails for upcoming programs, there is not a box out there. <laughs> but if you just give us your email at the end of the program, we can add you to the mailing list and then we send out weekly announcements of all of our upcoming programs. All right, a few announcements before we get started. Next week at Lunch with Books, December 28th at noon, Eli Landy will be with us. He's a pianist and a really talented musician. He'll be playing some lesser known uh, West Virginia anthems for us, including one that he's written himself. To prepare us for the first Lunch with Books of 2022, that's Tuesday, January 4th, uh, we'll have with us WVU English professor, Dr. Sarah Morris, and the troubadour, Bob Gaudio, they'll take on one of the most famous West Virginia um, anthems ever, John Denver's iconic Take Me Home Country Roads, which turned 50 years old this year. Um, a reminder that tonight's, or that the next People's University is tonight, that's tonight, Tuesday, December 21st at 7 p.m. Uh, Dr. Hal Gorby will be with us. He'll be talking about the second Red Scare. That's 7 p.m. right here in the auditorium. Um, we'll also be broadcasting on YouTube and Facebook. And he'll be talking about the Carthyism and the paranoia. I'm sorry about the microphone. It's, we usually have to have them loud enough. It's made it's way too loud. Uh, but he'll be talking about the Red Menace on the home front. Uh, that's tonight at 7 p.m. Tuesday, December 22nd. The next week we go, we go back to Thursdays for People's University. So next week, um, People's University will be Thursday night, December 30th. It'll be class five, Dr. Kappel returns. We'll be talking about more bombs, bigger bombs, and better bombs. Anybody want to take a guess at what that lecture is about? <laughs> um, but it'll also be about acronyms. So if you want to find out what SID, AMB, SALT, MAV, and others acronyms stand for, come to that program, and you'll learn about bombs and acronyms. All right, today's guest, Don Feederty says he does not need an introduction. Um, he's introduced by his musical friends, Fair May, who will be playing traditional holiday music in their old time style. Please welcome a person that everybody knows, Don Feederty. She tells you all the great things that's going to come after you suffer through me. So I apologize. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the High Valley Public Library's Lunch with Books. I am Don Feederty, and this is. Civil Life Christmas. Some of you were here last year for Civil Life, Life Christmas. Actually, not here. We were online, but we were still there. And uh, that's where we talked about a Foxfire Christmas. We talked about the Foxfire book series. So many of us remember that. That is a series of books that actually affected so many people, changed so many people's lives throughout the country. It certainly was a major influence in my life, and I was really glad to be able to share that with you. This year, we're going to talk about Civil Life Gifts. I was trying to figure out what to do, and the first was going to be, well, I'll talk about another book, but you get that all the time. So I thought I'd just talk about anything, and, and hopefully I don't bore you too much. So I'm going to talk about what I call the Simple Life. And those of you who know me um, are probably familiar to a certain extent with the Simple Life posts I put on social media. So on Facebook, every so often, I post things about my daily life that it's not that I think these things are so wonderful, because they're not. They're, they're actually very common, very simple things. But they are so far from the norm for everybody else that I find that people tend to find them interesting, which kind of blows my mind because these are things that not too long ago nobody wanted to do, and even now most people don't want to do them. My wife and I actually find that these are the things that give us the most satisfaction. We call it the simple life because these are all simple things that used to be so common that everybody did it. Everybody knew these things. They were simple. But now we're bombarded with so much technology there's so much coming our way that we've gotten away from these things. And we expect to be entertained constantly and to just slow down and enjoy what you have that's very foreign. Now, people who know I talk about symbol life all the time, it's not like it's all the time. You know. Now, people who know I do that often have asked me if it is a religious lifestyle. Come on. No, it is not a religious lifestyle. Um, though the tenets of a simple life can be pretty much found in any of the major known religions that are out there. And that is basically be content with such as you have. So the simple life is a whole lot, <clears throat> the simple life is not a whole lot about getting everything you want. And it is a whole lot about appreciating what you have. And when you appreciate what you have, you find that you can be happy. And you 
tend to be happy, you end up not wanting a whole lot. And it makes for a very comfortable lifestyle. My wife and I moved on to a farm a little bit more than 20 years ago, and our lives changed. Everything became so much slower, so much more simple, and, and I really uh, ended up loving it. And I would like to share some of these simple things with you today. Some, I'm calling them all simple gifts. Some are just the gift of knowledge, the gift of information. And one of these simple little things that is so simple, we all do it. We've all done it. We all know about it. But we've gotten so far away from it that uh, we need technology to help us. Now, people think that since I'm talking about the things I talk about, like um, hunting mushrooms or making um, simple syrups out of forsythia bush, or um, preserving eggs, farm fresh eggs for up to two years in a jar with nothing more than water and pickling lime. And that's not pickled eggs, it's actually keeping the whole egg fresh. And I've been eating them the entire month of December, and they're 18 months old, and they're just as good as they were when, uh, when the chicken first laid them. So people think that since I talk about these things and that I do these things, that I have some fantasy about living in the days gone by, in the 19th or 18th or 17th century. And that's not truth either. Um, I do like things that were done then, and I do some of those things now, but I love technology. I have an iPhone, I do wear an Apple Watch, and I stream TV most evenings the same way most of you do, yay Netflix. So we love and embrace technology, and people ask me, where do you learn about these things that you do? Well, I like to say the internet machine. Uh, because I'm not a digital native, I still don't know how it all works, but Mr. Google or Mr. Google has all these things. No matter what it is you want to learn, you can Google it. And one of these things that technology helps us with, it's so simple, it can change your life. God just see this here. He can test to this. It can help you lower your blood pressure. It can help you reduce stress. It can help alleviate some anxiety. It can make your heart stronger. It can make your muscles and your organs better. And that simple thing is breathing. No, we're all breathing, of course, and we wouldn't be here, but I'm talking about deep breathing. This is something so simple. Our, actually, most of us grew up with it. Our parents would say, when we'd get angry, they'd say, breathe, breathe, breathe deeply. Count to 10. Well, they weren't trying to get us to count to 10 for any reason other than make the time to breathe deep, breathe slowly. And by going so, you're actually refreshing your body and calming yourself, and it has a positive effect. But the amazing thing is we have $100 watches now that tell us every so often, vibrate, they pulsate, and when you look, you think you have some kind of notification, you see that it's saying, it's time to breathe, but you ignore it, you thought it was going to be something else. A minute later, it vibrates again, you look, it's time to breathe, so you sorry, don't do it. You also notice that when you looked at it the second time, it says, even one minute of deep breathing can have positive effects, so you say, I'll do it. And then your phone also is it's telling you to inhale deeply, hold it for a second or two, and exhale. And you know if you're doing it according to the watch, you know if you're doing it right, because it will pulsate again when it's time to breathe in again. We need $500 worth of technology <laughs> to tell us to breathe deeply. But that's the life we have pretty much accepted. We're so used to this that that's how we live our lives. There are other things that this little device tells us. If I raise every so often, it tells us it's time to stand. We have to be told to stand, and many of us do. Because in our work lives, we sit, whether it's driving or at a computer or whatever, we sit. We go home and we sit. And then in the evening, we sit. So our watches have to tell us it's time to stand. And even better yet, our watches will vibrate to tell us it's time to walk around. <laughs> what a crazy life. But we have become so accustomed to this. Now, the simple life is about understanding and appreciating these things that we as a society have gotten away from. And I'm considering these gifts that thanks to Apple and, and other things that I'm, I'm offering from the simple life, from my, my world. Things like breathing and walking, these are good things. And there's a man out there who, uh, I believe his name's Carl, and on the internet, on Facebook, and on TikTok, he regularly gives away what I think is a very simple gift. And he's giving this away primarily, he says, to men over 50. He says men over 50 need this. And these things that he gives away freely, these simple little gifts are so amazing and so life-changing that I took these to my 90-year-old mother and said, Mom, you have to do these. I tried them, and they actually changed my life. And I'm going to share one of them with you. I'm going to ask you to do it with me if you want to. So this guy offers, on a regular basis, he costs three moves in three minutes. And basically, he takes between 15 and 30 seconds to show you three different moves or exercises that are very easy to do 
but they're designed to get us doing things we've stopped doing, usually because of age, but also often because of occupation. He teaches us to do these things, and he says, do each of these one minute, do three of them in three minutes, and in three minutes a day, you've done exercises. So most of us aren't going to go to the gym for 30 minutes to an hour every day. We're just not going to do it. But we can all give three minutes. And if we don't want to give three minutes, we can give one minute. So here's one of this. One of the first ones I learned that I thought was nothing but food, but it actually changed my life. If you want to, you can do it with me. Raise your hands over your head. So that's no big deal. Believe it or not, for probably half of us in this room, that's all the further we can reach our hands right now. But if you do this for a minute, you just move your arms around. And you do this for a minute every day. By this time next week, your arms are here. And soon your arms are here, and you're stretching your fingers, and you're twisting your hands, and you're making fists, and you're bringing your arms down, and you're bringing your arms up. And I would like for you, if you feel comfortable, between now and New Year's, to do this one minute a day, every day. Why? Well, how many of us, me included, how many of us have reached back to get our seatbelt, and ah, threw my shoulder out? Or even worse, my favorite, reach into the, it's all car related, cars are terrible. They're not, they're not. Reach back into the back seat to get an umbrella, only to throw your back out. And then your shoulder or your back is out for three months, six months, close to a year. Don't look at me like I'm the only one that's ever done this. <laughs> 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 it happens. And why does it happen? Well, we like to say, I must have slept wrong. Oh, did you sleep outside on the side? No, you didn't sleep wrong. You moved in a way that your body's not accustomed to moving, and you hurt yourself. So something as simple as that can change your life. Now these are very simple things, and what I'm trying to do here is lay the foundation that simple things can change your life. We live in a society where we think things have to be expensive, things have to be complicated, and things have to involve technology, or they're not worth our time. And what I'm trying to tell people on a regular basis is it's okay be a little bit weird. My niece, Lindsay, always call me weird Uncle Don. I wear that as a badge of honor because I am weird and I like to lead a very simple life. And there's one simple gift, perhaps to me one of the most magical simple gifts I've ever heard of, that I'd like to share with you today. And to do that, I'm going to ask for help from my friend Spare May, and that is the gift of music. Ladies and gentlemen, Spare May.
in our, our society. This was a time the, the, the his family, his family went through the Great Depression and the tail end of it. They went through World War II and they didn't know a lot of money, but they lived on the farm and uh, they had a good life. Now, the, 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 my buddy Shaw, his farm was on the ridge, on the farm, one ridge over from where my farm is today. I live on Jones Road. Shaw lived on Hard Road. There was a ridge in between, a ridge that was nothing but two little ravine sides with a peak on top, so flat you couldn't even build a house on top of it, barely build a house on top of it. And, uh, uh, Shaw grew up on that farm, and uh, on this particular day, Christmas Eve, 1951, he said it was very, very unseasonably warm, sort of like it is now. And he said it was so warm that he spent most of that day outside working with his shirt sleeves rolled up. He said he did all his chores, including cutting up firewood for the kitchen stove. He still, they still use the wood stove to cook with. They had electricity. You know, it's 1951, they weren't living in the dark ages, but, you know, electricity didn't go everywhere back then. This was rural Belmont County, not far from here. Um, so it was a little bit different. But he, he said he cut up the firewood and his shirt sleeve rolled up. It was that warm. His mom put out laundry that day, and he said she didn't wear a jacket or even a sweater. And this was the end of the day, and he was just getting all cleaned up, and he told his mom he was going to town because he had not yet got his mom or his dad or any of his siblings anything for Christmas, and he wanted to do that. Now, in past years, he would just make something, but this year he had to have a little bit of money, so he thought he was going to go and buy it. Now, the reason he had money is because he did what most of the other farm kids in that area did. When they were done with their chores, which they didn't get paid for, they would go to Old Man Finney's farm. You remember Old Man Finney? Old Man Finney, most of us know him because he had the best grape vineyard in the entire area. Old Man Finney just was known for his grapes. Old Man Finney bought this piece of land, this ravine, this peak with no real soil on the top. He bought this and called it a farm back in 1901. He bought it for so cheap because nobody wanted it. It was just all rocks. But Old Man Finney grew up in Ireland where he and his family farmed rocky soil just like that. So it wasn't a problem for him. On one side of this ravine, the one that faced north, next to Hart Road where Shaw lived, he raised grapes. He put in a vineyard and he had champagne grapes and he had wine grapes. He had grapes for juice. He had grapes for jellies. He raised grapes just as table grapes, which were almost unheard of back then. Not only did he do that, but on the other ravine, the one side that faced south, he put in a an orchard. He had peach trees, pear trees, and apple trees. And the kids in the area would come and pick his fruit in late summer and early fall because at this point, old man Spinney's wife had passed away. His kids had all moved away. He was too old to get down in there and take care of it himself, but he just couldn't let go. So he'd hire neighbor kids from the neighboring farms and they'd come and do the work for him. And Shaw said that he would go there like every other kid and make the money. That's awesome where he and his friends that they're he and she. Because there were no adults around, oh man, Finney could get down there. So boys and girls picking fruit, you can imagine what that was like. But Shaw had made some extra money and he decided he was going to go into downtown Wheeling and he was going to buy gifts for his family. Now he could have gone to Mark's Ferry, it's a lot closer. But he wanted to come to Wheeling because in the theater over here on Market Street, they were playing a movie that he wanted to see, a movie all his friends in church told him about, a movie that his friends said, it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. They were playing 1951 A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. He thought of it as a horror film. He wanted to see this. He could hardly wait because his friend said, when the ghost of Christmas past appears on the screen, it is so realistic. You're going to think it's right there in the theater with you. And he had to see that. Now, Shaw had grown up. He was very, very familiar with the Christmas Carol. He read it every year in school since he was yay high. They listened to it on the radio every single year at Christmas time, probably sometimes he said two or three times a year, but tuned it into different stations, but he had never seen it. He wanted to see it played out, so he wanted to go to the movie. That meant he had to go to downtown Wheeling. So he told his mom he was getting ready to go. He was on his clean clothes. He starts out. His mom says, Shaw, it's winter. Are you going to wear a coat? He says, yeah, it's warm. He heads out. He walks down to the end of his lane. He gets off our road. Remember, I told you they're on ravines. It just went straight downhill. He walks down our road one half mile to get to the township road. He turns left and he walks that one half mile to get to the county road. And then he has to walk one half mile, you got it, to get to stop 10. Some of you know where stop 10 is there in Martin's Ferry. It was the old train station for the old zigzag and crooked. You remember the old zigzag and crooked? That was a narrow gauge railroad. It was the old zigzag from the old narrow gauge railroad that went from Zanesville, I believe, to Caddis. And by this time, 1951, it was no longer a train, uh, no longer a train line. 
but streetcars used the track. And old Stop 10, that old station was now a streetcar stop, and they called it Stop 10. So Sean walks this half mile, half mile, half mile. So that's how I learned to measure distance. You walk that so often, you know how much walking it takes to go a half mile. You walk that whole area three and a half miles, a mile and a half. If they got a package in the post, if they come to the house, he went to stop 10, he had to walk with the old skid, he had to walk down, get it, and walk back. So he could easily measure three miles. So he knew exactly how long it was going to take him from leaving the house to get to stop 10 so he could get on that streetcar and he got there just in time, no time wasted. And he rode down through Martin's Ferry. He comes down to the bridge board and he gets off there. He walks across the steel bridge to the island, across the island, the suspension bridge, across the suspension bridge to get to downtown Wheeling. And he figures, I better do my shopping first. So he goes straight over to the south end of the North Market, and he goes to the Joy Shop, and he immediately buys something there for his mother. And then, the Joy Shop is a little pricey. So he takes money he has left, he goes down to Murphy's 5 and 10. That's where he buys something for his dad. And he was so happy, because he ended up having enough money for the movie still, but he also had money left over, so he bought something for each of his little sisters. Then after he gives all his Christmas gifts, he's happy. He goes to hook up with his buddies. He's going to go see this horror flick, this uh, this movie that's going to change his life, so he thinks. And uh, he gets together with his buddies. And he wants to get to the movie in time because back then, some of you may remember, they showed newsreels. Well, he wanted to see newsreels because in 1951, living on a farm, the only news you got was if you went to the barber, which you didn't go very often. Mom usually cut your hair. If you go to the barber, you can see a newspaper. Or you can listen to the news on the radio, but if you wanted to see it, to go to the movies, unless you had TV. But Shaw wanted to see the newsreels because he was obsessed with the reclamation happening in Europe after World War II. He wanted to see what was being done, the buildings that were being re rebuilt. He, he was so anxious. And if truth be told, Shaw, even though he was getting up there, he still liked cartoons, and they also showed cartoons around the same time before the movie. So they get there half an hour early, they watch it all, and suddenly the movie starts. And Shaw told me, you got to understand, back then, what you saw in the movies, you had a tendency to think was real. It's not quite like it is today. You had a tendency to believe what you saw because you just spent 30 minutes watching a newsreel that was truthful. Of course, truthful was the propaganda that they made it. But he said you, you just believed it. So he started watching this, and he said it's like watching old friends. He knew the story so well, but somehow he wasn't prepared for the ghost of Christmas past. And he said, his friends were right. They didn't, they didn't tease him at all. They were right. When that ghost appeared, he said, you felt it. He said, you heard a collective sigh and the cinnamon. Everybody sunk down in the chairs a little bit. Same thing happened with the ghost of Christmas future and the ghost of Christmas present. He said, it was terrifying. And he remembered that when that movie ended, there were a couple things that bothered him. One, that the movie ended, he thought it would have been nice to go on a little bit longer. And the other, it bothered him that he got so upset with those ghosts. Thought they were that realistic. But it's over, time to go. He and his boys go to a soda shop right down the street. They got uh, ice cream floats. They got peppermint ice cream floats because that's what was the special for Christmas. So they all have the peppermint floats. He looks up, he sees the clock. He goes, Oh boy, I gotta go. If I don't go now, it's Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, the streetcar is gonna be done running. I'm not gonna catch it. I'm gonna have to walk an extra six miles to get there, and I don't wanna do that. So he goes as quick as he can. He crosses the suspension bridge and the steel bridge. He gets the bridge board. He's here just in time again. He gets on the streetcar. He's riding up to stop 10. Just time on the streetcar. He's just thinking about that movie. It was fascinating to him. He was thinking how lucky he was that he got to see that. And then somebody says, stop 10. So he realizes he snaps out of it. He gets out. He gets on the streetcar. Half mile county road turns right. Half mile township road turns right. He starts up Hart Road. I told you Hart Road's straight up and down in the middle of a ring. 40,000 years of erosion have washed all the soil off. There's water down in the bottom of these ravines. He starts walking up the hill and he says, first thing you notice was the temperature seemed to drop about 30 degrees from where it was when he left home that day. And he's suddenly cold and he starts to shiver and he pulls his collar up and he's walking up the hill. And then he notices that the fog had set in on part road from the ravine. And he said he could barely see his hand in front of his face. But it didn't really matter. He had walked this road so many hundreds of times, he could do it with his eyes closed. So he just walks on. He's almost to his lane. Then he hears something. Now he had walked this road so many times, he knew every smell, 
every sight, every sound. Any country kid knows the road. He heard something that did not belong there. It startled him a little bit. But he's a big boy. He's not afraid of anything. And he can't imagine anybody's out there, so he keeps walking. He hears it again. So he cocks his head to the side. He turns his left ear toward where the sound came from. He does that because Shelby and the oldest upon the farm, he was the one who drove the tractor. The muffler on that old tractor was on the right hand side, so he's a little hard here to this side. He can relate to that. So he talks, he's happy, he listens. He hears it again, and he thinks, I know that sound. And suddenly the hair on the back of his neck starts to stand up. His heart starts to beat a little faster, his breathing changes, and he's aware of this, but he's not aware of it. He just knows he feels uncomfortable all of a sudden. And then it hits him. He knows where he's heard that sound before. And he tries to logic it out, but he tells himself it is Christmas Eve. And he realizes he had said some things that he should have said. And he had done some things throughout the year that he probably should have done. And he realizes, darn, this is ghost of Christmas past. And he starts to get scared, but he knows how ridiculous this is. But then he hears a moaning sound. And he realizes the clunking, the metal sound he heard, the sound he heard first was the chains that were wrapped around the ghost. The second sound was the ghost moaning, and he starts getting scared, and he's just about ready to convince himself it's his imagination, and he sees it right there in front of him, about 30 feet in front of him, the ghost, I'm not, I'm not making this up, 100% true, the ghost of Christmas past, right there on Hart Road, coming to visit my buddy Shaw, and he's terrified, all logic is gone, and he turns he sees his lane, he turns, and he runs like a scared little rabbit. He runs home. And he's glad when he gets there to see that the lights are still on. He bursts into home. He shuts the door. He slides the bolt. He turns around. There's his mom and dad waiting up for him. His mom says, tell us about the movie. And he says, I'll tell you tomorrow. And he starts to walk into his room. And she says, well, tell us about the newsreels. He says, I don't want to tell you about the newsreels. And his dad says, boy, you get back here. I'm going to talk to your mother like that. He says, can't you just leave me alone? I just want to go to bed. He said, okay. But his mom says, Sean, you're out of breath. How in the world are you out of breath? He says, I ran. She says, you ran home? He said, no, I just ran up the lane. And she said, well, why in the world would you do that? Well, he's not going to be ridiculed. He says, I just want to get home and get to bed. They shrug their shoulders. They let him go. He goes and he goes to bed. He actually sleeps fairly well, a little bit fitful, but not bad. He wakes up Christmas morning. He loves Christmas morning. He remembers every year it's always been wonderful. But he wakes up long before the sun because Shaw was a farm boy, and farm boys and farm animals don't know holidays the way we do. Any work that needed to be done on any day of the year needed to be done today, whether it's Christmas or New Year, doesn't matter. So he gets up, he gets dressed, he goes out to the barn, he lights the kerosene lamp. I told you they had electricity. I mean, they're not cavemen. He, he just didn't have the barn yet. That cost more money. So he lit the kerosene lamp. Because the first thing he does every day, since he was a small child, was go out and put feed down for the family cow and milk her and take the milk in for his mother. That's his first chore every day. And that's very important because his family depended on that cow. That's where they got their milk, their cream, their butter, their cheese. We don't think much about it these days, but that family cow was very valuable to the child and his family. So he puts some hay down, he has the lamp lit, he goes out to the pen to get the cow, and she's gone. And he looks over, and the rails, the poles that he used to slide to keep the cow in were knocked down. He knows he said it before he left. She was in there, but she's out. He doesn't really worry too much about it. He starts calling. She doesn't call back. In the past, any time he'd call the cow, the cow would immediately call back. He knew where she was. She'd come to him. She doesn't call. She doesn't come back. So he thinks, oh, great. So he gets the lamp. He goes out. He's looking for the cow. Can't find her anywhere. And he hears that sound again, that metal clunking together. And he thinks, no, 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 no. There's no such thing as ghosts. And besides, it's Christmas Day. Ghosts don't come out in the day. And then he hears it moaning. He swallows hard. His heart's beating fast again. He's getting scared. And then he sees the ghost of Christmas past again. And he's terrified. And he's just about ready to turn and run. Forget about the family cow. Just about ready to turn and bowl. And suddenly the ghost starts coming toward him. Lumbering from side to side, hovering above the ground. And all of a sudden, this great calm, this great Christmas calm comes over Shaw. And he realizes 
how silly he'd been. And he walks up to that ghost and he reaches out, takes the bed sheet off the cow's head, <laughs> leads the cow back, feeds her, milks her, hangs the bed, let it back up on the laundry. See, back then you didn't just put laundry out on the line to dry, you put laundry out if it needed to air out. You don't need to wash that bed spread all the time, sometimes you just air it out. Cow got loose, walked through the laundry and got it. He decides he's going in. He's never going to tell a soul about that ghost because he doesn't want to be the butt of every joke. Seventy years later, he told me to now tell me. But that's not the end of it because Sean never told anybody until seventy years later when he told me. And I only just told you. It would not be the urban legend that it is today. The urban legend, at all of you know, the ghost, the Christmas ghost of Park Road. I mean, it's been in the newspaper. It's so common. But there are other people who live that hard went to church on Christmas Eve. The folks who went to the Presbyterian Church went around 6, 30, 7 o'clock. They drove down on the hill. Didn't see anything, but on the way back, their kids saw the ghost. Parents didn't believe them. A little bit further out the road, was a family that went to St. Mary's. I'm sorry, St. John's, the Catholic Church there in Barnes Ferry. They went down to Midnight Mass. They all saw the Christmas ghost. They didn't stop, but they all saw it. And sure enough, they tell friends in the church, they tell friends at work, they at school, they tell them all about the ghost, the Christmas ghost in Park Road. And soon everybody knows the story. And every year when Christmas comes around, they all tell the story. And my buddy Shaw, for 70 years, he just snicker at him like it was a cow. <laughs> <laughs> but he never told a soul. And what I'm telling you today is things aren't always as they seem. And sometimes it's the simple things in life that have the most meaning. So once again, we have a very simple gift. This time, since you're also scared from that ghost story, we're going to play a Christmas polka. Fair man. <laughs> Now, 
It was back, I'm going to say late summer, early fall. I got a call from our friend Sean Duffy here at Bunch of Books, and Sean said, Hey, I wrote a screenplay and I want to shoot a short film. I said, Great, good for you. He says, I need somebody to shoot it for me. I said, Okay. He said, I'd like you to shoot it for me. I said, Okay. So I reached out to my buddy Jared Thompson. First thing, you know, we're spending the day with Aaron. Sean and a bunch of weirdo zombies uh, who <laughs> turned out to be wonderful people. And, and we shot this short film and it was a very big success. It was to promote lunch of books for um, Halloween. And I mention this because it's not the last time you're going to hear about it. Sean's out for a while now on medical leave, but when he comes back, we've already established he's the one who's going to do all the work. Uh, we're going to be entering this. We've already been asked to enter in the uh, short film contest and we're going to just going to speak out on faith because you know I only tell 100% the truth. Um, <laughs> we're going to win awards all over the place. And it's not going to be the last short film we do. And I love that, that Sean, in his simple story of zombies, managed to put the history of the High Valley and he put all four of our historic cemeteries in there. I thought that was wonderful. But Sean, when we were finished, he said, I'm going to give you a stipend for helping out. I said, I won't take it. I don't want it. He said, Well, let me give you something. I, said, I truly don't want anything. I have everything I want. There's nothing you can give me, first of all, probably that I'll appreciate. And nothing that I want. So let's just say no. Two weeks later, I get a package in the mail. Sean Duffy, I come from the library. And I thought, oh, great. So I opened it, thinking, what kind of terrible gift did he give me? And he gave me a very simple gift. He gave me a book 50 Things to Do with a Pocket Knife. And I thought, he really thought this out. He knows I like pocket knives. He knows I like to make things. That's part of my simple life. So I started going through this, and right away I saw all kinds of things I wanted to make. So I'll put a bookmark, and he also gave me a bookmark plug for the library. And uh, I'm going through, and I, I mark something, and then I notice there's something else on the back in the bag. And I pull it out, and it's a uh, pocket knife. You'll appreciate this. It's not just any pocket knife, it's a quality French made pocket knife. And, uh, Usually people use this for culinary purposes. It's a wonderful picnic knife. I've already abused it to pieces. You can see the scars all over it. Because the first thing I did was I thought, you know, I'm going to fix his wagon. I'm going to make him something. So I went out to my wood collection. Because any great craftsperson has a wood collection. Now you would think my wood collection would be nice stacks of oak and walnut and cherry lumber. No. I had a little bit different thought in mind because I'm kind of a simple kind of person. I went out to my woodpile. Not just any part of my woodpile. I went out to a very specific part of my woodpile because we burned wood on the farm. I went out to a part of my woodpile that was stacked in 2008. I remember 2008. It's when the, everything crashed and I started thinking for the first time I'm going to depend on firewood to keep my house warm because all of a sudden all my stocks and money is gone. It just <laughs> disappeared overnight. So um, a couple of cherry trees fell that year. I cut it up, I split it, I stacked it. And I split so much, there was no work. I was a commercial photographer. There was no work to do for like a year. So I put a lot of firewood away. Ends up, this cherry wood now is 10 years dry. Sounds like an AA meeting. 10 years dry. <laughs> And as being 10 years dry, most people like to carve wet wood. I don't because then it's going to shrink and crack and split. I went out and I got this piece, knowing it would be nice to carve. And I took my axe and I split off a little piece of it. This is firewood. I throw this in my fire and my furnace to burn. Most people don't think of it as craft wood, but when you live a very simple life, you think, what can I do with that? So then I drew a little drawing on it, and not this particular piece, this is a problem. I took this piece of wood and I drew on it. And then I took my pocket knife and I started whittling on it. And I made, this is Duffy, one of my favorite things to make. I made it before. I made him a magic wand. Because I believe in magic. And I believe in the power of this magic wand. This magic wand is amazing. And I knew that if I made this magic wand for Sean Duffy, he would keep it and use it the rest of his life because he too believes in magic. Now this magic wand is truly, I'm not exaggerating, this is not part of the story. This truly is a magic wand, and you'll believe me before I'm done. Because this magic wand, if I take a bowl, and I put dry, edible ingredients in it, and I add some liquid water, milk, soy milk, 
whatever you want. And I add maybe a little butter, a little oil, maybe an egg, and I take this magic wand, and I go like, well, I go like this, and I mix those ingredients together. Magically, what's in that bowl turns into a product that I can eat up and make food. Now, this magic wand has other traits. This has the ability to take you back in time. This magic wand, we all see it, has the ability to do time travel for all of us. Because Sean is going to make his Christmas meal using this magic wand. If I have to go to his house and make it work. And then six months down the road, a year down the road, two years down the road, he's going to pick this up because he's going to use it every day. I know he will. It's just what happens. He's going to pick this up and he's going to think back to it. Remember, I made cookies Christmas Day or Christmas Eve or whatever day back in 2001, and I used this. I My first one of these was over 20 years ago, and I still use it daily. I make my meals with it daily, and I can remember meals I made for my family, meals I made for my wife, things I made for myself just by picking this up and holding it. So a simple, simple thing, throw a piece of firewood, you can make a simple gift from a simple gift, and it has magic power to create food. And that just blows my mind. As is the practice of any simple nut like me, when you go and you look at a beautiful piece of wood like this, isn't that a beautiful piece of wood? I know you're thinking I'm a plug. When I look at these pieces of wood, I start seeing opportunities. And while I was there, I saw three other pieces of wood. And I'm very stingy with the things I make. I spend so much time making them and sanding them. I love to sand them and oiling them. And I oil them with vegetable oil or olive oil. I don't usually sell them or share them. I like to keep them myself. So out of three other pieces of that cherry wood, I made this little set of wooden bowls. And <laughs> it started out, I used this little bowl every day, nuts, chips, things like that. And it grew to this one. Now I like to fill this bowl up every day. Um, I use these bowls every day. How much simpler does it get than that? Things the average person would throw away. It all comes down to how you look at it. If you want your life to be incredibly complicated, go for it. You can have as complicated a life as you want. But if you want to just slow down a little bit and appreciate the things you have, things like the yellow forsythia bush that's going to bloom this spring, going to bloom everywhere, every one of you see it. It doesn't matter where you see it. You go and you take some of those blossoms off and put it in a jar with sugar and water. It makes the most amazing simple syrup that tastes like nothing else you've ever had. So these are some simple gifts. Well, also, I have a simple gift um, I posted on my Simple Life the other day about mushrooms. This is a giant puffball mushroom. So I see a head shaking. Somebody at least saw my Facebook post. By the way, blatant self-promotion. Don Peterty on Facebook or the Long House in Mount Pleasant. Um, we post these kind of things all the time. My wife and I bought an 1806 two-story log house in Mount Pleasant. Spent the last six years redoing it. And it's, it's really it's a beautiful mm -hmm. structure. And we're now making it available for the public as often as we can. And um, we will be releasing today after this program, sometime early this evening, the story I just told you. I actually went and practiced it in the log house and we recorded it. My wife edited it together, edited it together. Of course. And uh, we're going to put that out. You'll also be able to watch this that the library is streaming and make available. But if you want to see the story, it might be better than the one I just delivered. You can uh, go to the log house, Mount Pleasant, Don Peter, get on Facebook. But this is Puffball Mushroom. And this mushroom, it's not that big when I found it. In puffball, if you're familiar with it, it has the consistency of white bread. It doesn't have that chewy, gummy feeling that mushrooms normally have. It feels like white bread. And you can eat it any number of ways. I like to fry it up fresh. But you get so much of it, if you don't do something, it rots right away. So what we did was we dehydrated it. And I posted this on Facebook the other day, and Jerry L. Rhodes said, I would love to find Puffball sometime. I want to taste it. I want to know what the texture is like. So this is some that I just put in a jar. And I hope she enjoys it. If she gets sick or dies, let me saw <laughs> But you know, the simple gift and the simple life idea doesn't just come from me. When I was trying to come up with what I was going to do for this program, I had ideas in mind. But I saw a post my wife put on Facebook. And she asked, what all can be done with a family heirloom that is damaged? And I thought, well, that's interesting. So my wife had this aunt that she was so fond of, Aunt Charlotte. She's passed away now. And Aunt Charlotte thought so highly of my, my wife when she was little. 
and they were always together. And when my wife Angela was little, she would lay on the bed and play with this hobnail bedspread that Aunt Charlotte had. So one day, right before we got married, Aunt Charlotte gave this family heirloom to my wife. She's going to be with us forever. And my wife put it on our bed in our first house. And we both go to work and we come home from work that day. And we're greeted by our dog Hogan. It's a big Marmaduke kind of dog. Some of you remember Hogan maybe from back in the day. Um, Hogan lived to be 17 years old. He was big, obnoxious, and just a rotten dog. And we came home, he greeted us at the door, and we noticed on the floor there were these white trails leading out of the kitchen. So we went, we followed it. My wife gets down, she says, It's sugar. Here we were going to bake something, and Hogan saw a bag, we found a bag of sugar on the counter. Big dog, he gets up, he puts his mouth around it, he walks around the house, follows it to the sofa. There's a big wet lick spot, all sticky on the sofa, leather sofa, where Hogan, we used to call him his baby, he would do this all the time. He would take his baby, they'd just go and lick it, and keep his arms around it, his legs around it. Well, it wasn't there though, and there was a trail leading upstairs, and we followed up to the bedroom. Yes, Hogan takes. His baby, the bag of sugar, puts it in the middle of this family heirloom of the health and spread. And as if that weren't bad enough, he liked to swaddle his babies. So he swaddles his baby all up in this family heirloom. And then he likes sweets. So he chews a big hole in it. So by the time we come home, my wife walks in. There's her family heirloom. At this point, Aunt Charlotte had just passed. Dog ruined it. I'm thinking I should throw that away right away so she doesn't have to see it. No, she washes it, dries it, folds it, puts it away. Forty years later, she goes on Facebook. She's going through some stuff. And she's, what all can I do for the family heirloom? And somebody said, you can make star-shaped Christmas ornaments. Okay. Somebody said, you can make gift bags. So I'm now gift bag. This is all out of something that had a hole in it that was going to be thrown away. On her own, she said, I can make little Christmas stockings. So somebody said, make little snowball gifts, make snowballs ornaments. We did that. Somebody said, somebody said, I break this, I'm in trouble. Make a snowman. So she made a little snowman. It goes on and on and on, and I'm going to have to show it all. I'm going to start it. Um, other ornaments. Uh, a wine bag, if you're going to give somebody a bottle of wine. Four snowballs. Here's mine. My suggestion was, mine was make pillows. So she made pillows, and people just kept sending all kinds of things. Somebody said make garlands, so here's uh, you know, all kinds of Christmas garlands stretched out. And then there was, I got the gift for it, this one. Somebody said make a Christmas tree. I don't know if you noticed or not. That's from my wood pile. That's a piece of wood I cut off. I use that to start the fire with. So these are all things that when you reuse, repurpose, repair, instead of throwing it away and buying new because you live a simple life, you don't want to throw it away and buy new. You find that something as simple as taking an old heirloom and making all these wonderful items out of it makes you feel good inside. Now, I have one more very special gift. This one is a gift that we gave you last year, and I promised as long as I could, I wanted to give this gift every year. I'm going to go cry like a baby. That's you guys. <laughs> Jerry L. Henthorne in that order.
ಎಲ್ಲರೂ ಬರುವುದಿಲ್ಲ 